Welcome to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the museum's public programs manager. Um, I'm really delighted that you all are spending your evening with us. And you know, we are uh, wrapping up a historic year here. <laughs> no matter where you're streaming in from, that's certainly the case. And for us here in Santa Cruz, in addition to everything else our country and the world has endured, we uh, have also gone through a devastating fire in our community. And tonight we are going to be reflecting back on the CZU Lightning Complex, but also um, taking a moment to look forward to uh, how our landscape continues to be impacted by that event. And before I invite in our special guest to help us do this, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land from which I am streaming in and the lands impacted by the CZU Lightning Complex are the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi, Chitoni, Kiroste, and Sayanta people. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. And part of uh, the way that they're doing this is reintroducing cultural burns to this area. And we encourage you to further explore their efforts. So today's program uh, will last about an hour and please feel free at any time throughout the event to ask questions through the chat and Q&A functions. Um, our speaker has given me permission to interrupt him. So we are happy to take questions at any time. Um, and you can practice using the chat now by telling us the name of the tribe whose territory you are streaming in from because we are all on indigenous land. And if you um, are not sure, I'm gonna put a uh, link in the chat, uh, which can help you identify um, the indigenous territory that you are on. So please take a moment to tell us hello in the chat. And again, switch from who you're sending the message to from the option for just panelists to instead the option for panelists and attendees um, and let us know where you're streaming in from. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome in our special guest speaker who we're very grateful to have join us today, uh, geomorphologist Noah Finnegan, who is a professor of earth and planetary sciences um, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and he's going to be giving our presentation, Fire and Mud today. So thank you for being with us, Noah. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, start talking to you guys. Um, hang on, let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Is it, how does that look? Um, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So um, I just want to um, reiterate what Marissa said. You know. My hope here is to give you guys an overview of the science um, th to the extent that we understand it about the connection between sort of catastrophic erosional events and, and fire in California. But the other hope here is that, um, you know, you get some resources out of this talk to the extent that, you know, you live in Boulder Creek um, and you're worried about what might happen this winter. My hope is, is to provide you with some information and resources so that you can you know, arm yourself with more information. And so to the extent that you have questions, you know, I really encourage you to ask in the talk or alternatively, feel free to look me up um, online and, and shoot me emails about this. Um, okay. So um, without further ado, let's get started. Um, the title of the talk is Fire and Mud, Why Fires Cause Debris Flows uh, in California. <clears throat> and I, you know, I should just say I'm a geomorphologist, which means I study erosion for a living. Um, and, uh, but I don't really work on this problem of debris flows specifically. Um, and and I, I like to think that that's an advantage in this regard because I'm somewhat agnostic about the sort of different sci scientific views on this problem. And so I'm hope hoping that I can give you kind of a overview of what's known without um, trying to stake out some sort of scientific terrain uh, in this debate. Um, but I have also spent a lot of time in the Santa Cruz mountains over the 11 years that I've been teaching at UC Santa Cruz. So I do have a good intuition for, generally speaking, how this landscape operates. Okay, um, so here's a roadmap for the talk today. Um, I'm going to begin by just defining what a debris flow is, so we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how they form. And then from there, I'd like to talk about 
what's the connection to fire? Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about the post CZU fire debris flow hazard in the Santa Cruz mountains, um, what, what we're kind of anticipating and, and also what we know from the last time there was a big fire in the Santa Cruz mountains, which was the Lockheed fire, which was really the year I started at UC Santa Cruz in 2009. And so we had some observations from that um, wet season following the Lockheed fire that can help uh, inform our understanding of the, the hazard um, for the coming winter. <clears throat> okay, so before I get started, just a quick um, thing that it's sort of a thing that bugs me in the media that I just want to touch on, which is that you often will hear on the news people refer to mudslides. Um, and I want to sort of just differentiate what is a debris flow um, and just note that, again, we use the term mudslide, mudslide and debris flow interchangeably, which in my mind leads to some confusion because, um, in fact, for people that think about these problems, a slide um, is, you know, something, can you guys see my cursor there uh, when I do that, Marissa? Yes. Okay, great. So a slide, you know, is something that is a, you know, some kind of mass movement on the surface of the earth where you have the earth moving as kind of a, a relatively solid block, like is shown here from this image from Peru. Um, alternatively, a debris flow, which is what we're going to talk about today, is really, is a, is a, um, phenomenon where you have the earth being fluidized. And so we have transport of material that's moving as a fluid across the landscape. Okay. And, and although the news often refers to these things as mud slides, um, in fact, they aren't slides, they're flows. And that's important for understanding um, their hazard. And so um, this is not just a matter of semantics, but it's sort of important for thinking about um, how these things work. Okay. So with that, I'll get down off my soapbox and just continue on the talk. Um, what is a debris flow and, and how is it different from a typical flood? So the US Geological Survey um, defines a debris flow as a sediment and a water mixture that becomes a slurry that's up to like 50 to 80% by volume comprised of sediment that's similar uh, to wet concrete in kind of consistency. These debris flows can achieve extremely high velocities relative to water flowing in a river channel. They can transport large boulders in suspension, and they can cause catastrophic damage from impact or burial. Okay, so for example, here is a image from, a, from the Montecito debris flows, which many of you I'm sure remember from the news just a couple of years ago in January of 2018, following the Thomas fire in the hills above uh, Montecito, just uh, south of Santa Barbara. Um, and you know what you see here is a house that's buried in mud and note that the rocks are sitting on top of the mud right and you know it doesn't you don't have to be a particle physicist to understand that typically when we drop a rock in water it sinks right and so this is one of the interesting aspects of debris flows is that in fact they're able to support the weight of rocks on them that's one of the reasons they're so uh, destructive okay so um I'm going to, uh, you know, some other sort of take homes about debris flows and what really differentiates them from um, just a flood in a river, um, which more of you probably have some experience with, is that debris flows are denser. They can be up to 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed, which is double the density of water. Okay, They can move much faster than water, up to about 20 miles per hour. Um, and in addition, as I just stated, in contrast to water, debris flows can support the weight of boulders without them sinking. And that really has to do with the fact that when you add a lot of sediment to water, it stops behaving physically like water at that point, and it starts behaving like something that has quite different properties um, than water does. So the combination of these factors results in flows that transport boulders and have much more momentum, which in physics we think of as a measure of how difficult it is to stop something. So they have much more momentum than water does. This is why debris flows are comparatively more destructive than river floods. Um, but importantly, river debris flows travel down existing stream networks, so they kind of exploit the drainage system that's already developed on the landscape. What I'm going to show you now is a, is a video of a debris flow from a location in Switzerland um, where there's very regular debris flows and, and which has allowed for a lot of work to understand how these things work, uh, how these things operate. Um, I'm going to mute myself because it's really loud. Um, and so we're going to watch this quietly. And, and the idea here is not sort of, uh, you know, to terrify people, but rather just to sort of give you a sense for the dynamics of how these things work and how they are really fundamentally different from 
um, a river flood. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mute and then go. No, I think you're not muted, I don't think. And then I can't hear the video. Okay. Um, did that work for everybody? Did, could you see the video? Could see the video. I couldn't hear. Um, I think the roar that you were into. I didn't want the roar. The roar is just. Oh, okay. I see. I, I tried to turn it off, but you guys could uh, could watch it. Um, it. It's just it just sounds like loud noise. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and so so the the point in showing you this video was just to you know point out a couple things that are are kind of different about debris flows that are also summarized in this diagram here. You know, and you saw this in the video. They typically have a, a bouldery snout at the front that's sort of an accumulation of boulders right at the front with a sort of more liquidy kind of chocolate milk like tail behind them. And you really saw that in the video as the front passed through, and then you saw the kind of relatively more liquid tail to the system. This is very characteristic of debris flows when you see them. Um, there's an internal sorting process um, with the boulders that results in them being concentrated at the front of the flow. So that's definitely the most dangerous part of the flow. Um, but, you know, and, and th this is sort of uh, schematic if you were to imagine looking at one of these things from the side as it was going down a river channel. And in some ways, I mean, you can think about this as like someone driving a locomotive down the side of a mountain, right? It has a lot of velocity and a lot of mass and they're quite hard to stop once they get going. <clears throat> okay, so, so then this question of, you've seen what it looks like, you kind of have a description of what it is. So how does a debris flow form? Um, the majority of post-fire debris flows, um, and in, in fact, debris flows in general, we think form from a process that we call bulking. And during bulking, erosion of soil by water flowing over the land surface results in an increase in concentration of sediment as a flow moves down a river network, as it moves downstream and downhill. Until the, that flow uh, accumulates enough sediment, then it kind of crosses that transition where it stops behaving like water and it starts behaving like wet concrete. Um, and, and that uh, transition again is around something like 50 to 80% sediment by volume, okay? In addition, um, landslides does, that are sort of catastrophic failures of, the, of very steep hill slopes can sometimes mobilize directly into debris flows. Um, and that's, that's another important way that they uh, form. However, in the post-fire landscape, that's a much less common way that debris flows happen. So we're really gonna focus on that first mechanism. That said, there is just another, I should, for the sake of completeness, there's a, a sort of a more exotic flavor of debris flow that's referred to as a thin debris flow that can form above uh, water repellent layers that occur in burned soils, which is something I'm gonna talk a lot more about in a couple of minutes. But again, the majority, just to emphasize, the majority of post-fire debris flows form from this process called bulking, um, which again is due to progressive erosion of the soil by water flowing downhill through a river network. Okay, so this is a, um, a nice example of um, a landscape, in this case in New Mexico, um, courtesy of a, a, a USGS scientist, John Moody, who's worked a lot on this problem. And, and you know, what you're seeing here is this sort of erosional scar on the valley bottom of a recently burned landscape. And you can see all the roots exposed on the side of this bank here that's attested to the fact that there's been a huge amount of vertical erosion into this landscape very recently. Um, and it's exposed all these boulders, right? And so the sense you have is that a huge amount of soil was removed um, all at once from this landscape. And that's kind of the, the signature associated with this process of bulking, right? You have some flow that's had the capacity to erode the ground um, much more effectively than the flows that had come previously, okay? And that's kind of the, the key thing here. So um, we can see really good evidence for bulking. And indeed, this was the key process that was associated with the sort of catastrophic debris flows that happened following the Thomas fire um, above the hills of Montecito um, a couple of years ago. So here's just a Google Earth image of the hills 
above Montecito before the Thomas fire. Um, and here is the same landscape um, following the January 9th storm that put the fire out and then also triggered all these debris flows at the same time. Um, so this was a really remarkable storm, um, very unique, extremely intense storm. But I'm just gonna toggle back and forth so you guys can see. You see the river network uh, sort of obscured by chaparral. And then in this landscape, you can see that the chaparral has been burned off the landscape. But the other important thing to see is the kind of dendritic channel network is really clearly defined in white in this image, right? And that is because the landscape has been scoured um, down to bare bedrock by flowing water, such that the tips of this channel network have extended almost to the drainage divide here, right? You see this beautiful tree-like branching of the river network that is recording the erosion that happened by this channelized flow um, that occurred in this very large storm in January 9th. Okay, so that's how we think most of reef flows are triggered is through this progressive downstream erosion that leads to the concentration of sediment in flows, which in turn leads to changes in the physical properties of the, the flow itself. Um, what's the connection to fire then? Um, in other words, why, why is the post-fire landscape more susceptible to this type of erosional process? Well, I would urge you guys all to look at a wonderful book um, by a great, um, writer, uh, uh, John McPhee, who's written a lot on the topic of earth science and in particular wrote a, a wonderful book called The Control of Nature, um, where he has a, sec a chapter or a whole section of the book called Los Angeles Against the Mountains that does a really good job of much more eloquently than I can do in this talk of kind of, talk, of going over the details of the science um, that I'm trying to summarize briefly here. Um, and again, he's a much, much more articulate than I am. So uh, it'll be a much more enjoyable read. Um. <clears throat> No, before you um, move on, we did have a question just about the picture that you just showed. Yeah. Um, someone is curious about the perspective. It says um, the debris flow looks like the perspective is backwards from that picture from the picture before. Do yep. you, yeah. It's not. So, so if I can, um, I'm going to use my, so I'm going to trace the drainage divide. So the highest portion of the landscape here is this. That's a ridge line like this. Okay. And then these are stream network, channel networks that are dry for most of the year because this is a dry part of the landscape. And, and you can just see them barely um, through the, the chaparral here, okay? Now, if I change, the next picture is gonna be the exact same perspective. Here's that ridge line. Um, and here is the channel network, which is much clearer now that you can see all the, the um, the vegetation removed. So stream channels coalesce as you move downhill. So generally speaking, the branching, it, the, the direction that it's branching is pointing uphill. Yeah, quite a change. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so yeah, have a look at this book. It's a really excellent um, description of, of the processes that I'm talking about here. Okay, so what's the connection to fire? Well, to think about the connection to fire, we first have to kind of just do a quick crash course in hydrology and think about what happens when it rains on the landscape? And kind of the key thing here is that, you know, if we're on a hill slope that has some vegetation on it and it starts raining, the rain can go in one of two places. It can go into the ground, which is a process that we refer to as infiltration, or if it doesn't infiltrate into the ground, then it creates what we call runoff. And runoff is the thing that goes into rivers. Infiltration is the thing that goes into the ground, right? So we you know, define a mathematical relationship such that runoff equals precipitation minus infiltration. In other words, the difference between what falls on the ground and what goes into the ground is fundamentally what flows over the landscape, okay? And it's this runoff that causes soil erosion on hill slopes because it's the part of the flow that's moving rapidly over the ground surface. Following fires, Burned soils have very little capacity to infiltrate water. You can think of burning as a process that's akin to like paving the landscape, um, albeit for a very short period of time. Therefore, the amount of runoff tends to be much greater in recently burned landscapes. Um, there are multiple hypotheses, which I'll touch on, for, that have been proposed to explain why this happens, but it's actually somewhat controversial. Um, there's a lot of different ideas about this, but suffice it to say that we know that this occurs. Um, so here's an example, and so, so that all that water that used to soak in the ground is now being forced to run over the surface, and it's that run, runoff that really leads to the increased erosion. Um, 
So here's just an example of a recently burned soil and you're seeing that kind of pavement at the surface that's the burned layer that really acts um, as a seal on the soil for a brief period of time. Here's just a plot that's really emphasizing that. So what you're seeing here is data from a watershed in Arizona. The crosses are the, define the relationship between individual storms where you have some measured precipitation um, compared to the depth of runoff. So you have a storm that produced, you know, where, where uh, there was, you know, a 300 um, millimeters of precipitation. Um, and I'm uh, sorry, that's, that's seasonal. That's, that's seasonal. That's a lot of rain for one storm. So this is, each one of these is a season where you have, that's the total rainfall during the summer compared to the total runoff that was generated during the same season, right? And in general, for years where there was no fire, which is the crosses, you see this sort of nice relationship. But in these two red points define periods after large fires occurred. And in both in those cases, you see that the amount of runoff that you're generating for a very modest amount of precipitation is much, much larger than for years um, when you had even more precipitation, but importantly, no burning. So this is just the kind of data that people use to try to quantify these effects, which is a really important part of the um, estimation of hazard. Okay, as far as why infiltration decreases following fires, like I said, there's a lot of ideas and this is one of these areas where people actually um, get into heated debates about it. Um, but, you know, the basic idea is one is there's this formation of a soil water repellency um, from burned organic compounds and leaf litter. So the idea is that there's kind of oils, especially in Mediterranean climates, a lot of the plants have, a, have are very oily to retain water. And, and when that burns, you can get this kind of sealant on the landscape for a period of time. In addition, there may be a process of soil sealing where the pores in the soil get clogged with ash and clay that settles into the pore spaces. And that might be coupled with losses in soil organic matter that's burned during the fire. Um, and then finally, you know, when you, when you burn a landscape, um, you remove vegetation, which allows water to flow more freely and more easily over the land surface. So just by virtue of the fact that the water can move more quickly across the landscape, it has less opportunity, has less time to infiltrate into the ground. So all of those things lead to increases in runoff following fires. And the kind of the key thing from the perspective of debris flows is that that increased runoff flowing over the soil that has lost vegetation leads to deeper and faster flows. This in turn triggers erosion on slopes and in gullies, which leads to increasing sediment loads as streams go downstream and eventually to the formation of debris flows through this bulking process. So some of you longer term residents of this part of the world may remember the Marble Cone Fire, which happened in Big Sur um, the year after I was born in 1977. Um, these are some beautiful data from that event um, by one of our own Santa Cruz USGS scientists, John Warwick, who's showing you the relationship between river discharge, in this case, in Arroyo Seco. So this is Arroyo Seco that comes down the west side of the Santa Lucia's into the Salinas Valley, kind of near the town of Greenfield. Um, and one of my favorite places in the world, actually a really interesting place for a lot of reasons. Um, but this is a relationship between the river flow in Arroyo Seco and the amount of sediment that's being carried by the river, okay? And, and the open circles here are from data prior to the Marble Cone fire. And the black circles, field circles, are from one year, the year 1978, after the Marble Cone Fire. And what you're seeing is that this is a logarithmic scale. Um, and the amount of sediment that the river was carrying for a given discharge was about 100 times larger for the year following the Marble Cone Fire than it was for the years preceding the Marble Cone Fire. So this is a testament to, the fat, to that, that extremely erosive nature of the post-fire landscape due to the enhanced runoff. In addition, another thing that happens in post-fire landscapes is, is this interesting process where in a steep landscape, like we get in places in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and in particular, like we get in Southern California, um, loose sediment can be supported on hill slopes by brush. Um, in other words, like these yuccas and things like we see here can actually hold loose sediment above the angle of repose, acting kind of a, almost like a dam. And when that material incinerates, that material, which we call dry ravel, accumulate, it flows down the hill completely under the action of gravity with no water involved. Um, and then it accumulates in gullies and stream beds and such that you see these kind of piles of loose sediment 
accumulating below recently burned slopes. And this also probably leads to very elevated sediment loads and streams following um, fires. Indeed, there are places that you see this process having acted um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, in particular, um, you know, the steep parts of the Santa Cruz Mountains where you have granite are very much prone to this type of process. So some of you who've been out and seen some of the burned landscape may undoubtedly have seen this happening. And, and firefighters know about this because this is one of the hazards associated with fighting fires um, is, is these dry gravel flows, which can come down the side of a mountain and can be involve pretty large rocks as well as burning timber and, and all manner of other things. So that's the reason why, um, why we have this association between erosion and, and the post-fire landscape. Um, so, you know, that, that, what that means is that fires in small, steep drainage basins, at least in Southern California, where this process has been studied much better, um, and we'll, we'll return to that theme um, in a second, the, these, uh, af after we see fires, we, we typically see elevated sediment loads from debris flows. Um, and the reason we know this is that outside of Los Angeles, um, particularly at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains, the, um, we've constructed a series of these basins to capture debris flows, to keep them from going out into the built infrastructure. Um, and these, uh, these debris basins, as they're called, um, provide us with the ability to measure how much material is coming out of the mountains um, in a pretty systematic way because they capture all of the debris flows before they get into the river networks and into the built infrastructure beneath the mountains. Um, so here's a plot showing you um, in the gray bars are um, the percentage of the watershed that was burned um, in a given year. Um, in this case, in Santa Anita Creek, which is a 25 kilometer squared creek um, in the San Gabriel Mountains. And so each one of these gray bars is, is a year where there was a big wildfire. And then the black bars are the amount of sediment production. In this case, we're taking the volume of sediment that was collected in the debris basin, and we're putting it back on top of the landscape and dividing by the area of the landscape. So you have a volume divided by an area, you get a depth. So this is like equivalent to the depth of rainfall, but in this case, we're talking about the depth of erosion. And so, um, and that's what that sediment production is, right? And so what you see is a very tight correlation between every time there's a fire, you see a big pulse of sediment that's coming out of the, um, this catchment um, in this location right here and right here. And, and this uh, has been verified in many, many catchments in Southern California that there's typically a very strong temporal association between when there's a fire and when you get debris flows coming out of catchments. That effect commonly lasts for about a year or two. So we see that there is, um, in the year or two following a fire, there's kind of this enhanced uh, risk of debris flows occurring, but that quickly goes away because that uh, re water repellency in the soil is a very ephemeral thing, right? We have a landscape with gophers and squirrels and that, that are constantly churning out the soil and all the organisms that live in the soil are breaking up that, uh, um, that, that water repellent layer. So it just doesn't last for very long. And indeed, the fact that we're having a late onset of winter right now is probably a good thing from the perspective of water repellency, right? The, the animals have had more time to kind of dig the soil. Okay, so let's transition now from kind of general science of debris flows to thinking about the landscape in the Santa Cruz Mountains and, and, the, and, and start thinking about the post-CZU fire debris flow hazard in the Santa Cruz Mountains itself. Here's a, a recent air photo from the USGS just showing you, um, this is Scott Creek. Um, so this is the, this is Scott Creek right here, Mill Creek, Big Creek, Little Creek, if you guys are familiar with it, obviously Highway 1 right here. Okay, so this is, this is the part of the landscape that burned pretty intensely in this last burn and also burned in the previous fire, the Lockheed fire. So it's, it's been burned a couple of times in the last um, 15 years. <clears throat> okay, so likely many of you guys are familiar, have seen a map like this, um, which is the uh, preliminary landslide hazard, post-fire landslide hazard assessment produced by the U.S. Geological Survey's Landslide Hazards Program, which is based in Golden, Colorado. Um, and this is a map that's showing you, as you can see right here, the probability of a debris flow occurring in a particular watershed in the Santa Cruz Mountains 
um, for a storm that has a 15 minute intensity of 24 millimeters per hour, which is to say that um, the, uh, 24 millimeters per hour is like an inch an hour. So this is saying, um, this is a, a map that's saying for a storm where it rains um, at a rate of an inch an hour for about 15 minutes, um, this is the estimate of what the probability of a debris flow occurring is in all these different watersheds. So here's the town of Boulder Creek. Um, this is Big Creek. Again, here's, here's the Scott Creek, uh, Mill Creek, Big Creek. Here's Big Creek right here, rather. Um, and uh, Waddell Creek is uh, further. Here's Waddell Creek right here, I should say. This is Scott Creek right here, and here's Waddell Creek. So this is not a physics-based model. This is not like a weather forecast model where we're really like solving uh, equations that are based on our understanding of the physics of how air moves in the landscape. But rather, this is purely empirical, which means that this is based on people looking at observations in other landscapes and, and trying to identify the variables that they think are important for triggering debris flows, and then trying to quantify some statistical correlation between how likely a debris flow is to occur given a combination of these variables. And in this case, the important variables are basically how severely the landscape is burned. And we have various ways of quantifying that from remote sensing imagery. Um, and then how much rain is falling um, and what the soil type is. And we, again, we have databases for sort of soil types. So the idea here is to be able to do something pretty quickly from data that we can largely collect remotely um, and take a first cut at understanding what the hazard would be, okay? And so this is kind of a picture of that sort of relative probability of debris flows occurring. And I would not take this as sort of gospel, but rather as sort of an indication of where scientists who work a lot on this problem think the sort of largest hazard is associated with this. And you see, you know, Waddell Creek really lights up here because of um, combination of, you know, how intensely it burned, um, and what the, what the soil types are there. But there are actually three different sort of products that the USGS has created here. And again, I put the link here and Marissa and I will, I'll give some information and we can distribute some of these links over email um, or post them on the um, museum website, just so you don't need to feverishly write down these links if you don't yeah. want to. Yeah, definitely. And also um, we did have a question come in based off the map that you are showing here, which is just different from a, another map that someone else has seen from the county. Okay. Um, have you seen multiple maps? Oh. I'm gonna show a bunch more. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> well, no, we'll keep, let's let's hold, hold tight on that. And if if I don't show you the map you're thinking of, then um, let's come back. But I'm gonna show you a bunch more of these things, okay? Um, okay, so this is one, this is sort of the probability of a debris flow occurring. Now in a separate, product the USGS also creates, which you can find at this website that I've linked here, is um, not a probability of debris flow, but rather an estimate of how big a debris flow would be. Um, and there's slightly different variables. There's a little bit more about the details of the topography than that go into this estimate. And you see the colors look a little different, right? Whereas Weddell Creek has a high probability of producing a debris flow. If it produces debris flows, they're relatively small because the catchments here are relatively small. Whereas like some of the, this is Jameson Creek um, here, uh, this is Clear Creek. These are big steep tributaries um, of the San Lorenzo River um, kind of above and below the town of Boulder Creek, which although maybe not as likely to have debris flows, nevertheless, um, if they do have debris flows will produce very large debris flows. And so then the third thing that you will often, you'll see on this website is a combination of these two um, a combination of these two things together, which is um, what's what's called, um, which is essentially a hazard map, where we're going to sort of combine the probability and the volume of the debris flows to try to come up with some sort of estimate of the hazard, which convolves those two things together, and that's what's shown here, right? And and you know, what you see here is their sort of low, moderate, and high hazard, you know what's not on this map is where people live, right? And so that's another important consideration here because there aren't very many people living in, in along Waddell Creek because that's of course it's in Big Basin State Park, right? Whereas there are a lot of people living along Highway 9 um, along, along the west, uh, west side of the San Lorenzo River here. 
So we're gonna focus in a little bit more on that area in particular. Um, but just as a footnote, really fast. Um, and I should say, I really encourage you to look at the website here from the USGS. They link to a lot of the sort of nuts and bolts for what actually goes into these models. So you can look under the hood and see what they're doing. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is not a physics-based model. So this is based on, uh, which I'll show you in a second, like observations from other places. And so there's good and there's, there's strengths to that type of approach, but there's also potentially uh, shortcomings to that kind of approach. But a quick footnote, um, when debris flows stop, um, they tend to construct these conical landforms, which we call fans, okay? And this is a beautiful example from Death Valley of the bad water fan. The reason this is a really, I'm using this example is because there's no trees in Death Valley. So it's really easy to kind of see what's going on in this landscape. And, and essentially the idea is if, if the flow stops here at one time, then um, it's gonna tend to cause the subsequent flow to go a different way. And then over time, what happens is that the flows just kind of go radially around um, from wherever they exit the mountains and, and construct this kind of conical thing that we call a fan. Okay. These fans are all over the Santa Cruz mountains, um, but they're harder to see because of the trees. Um, and, and until recently, we didn't have very good topographic maps, indeed, until last summer. Um, but here, here's a map that was just recently produced um, by some scientists at the California Geological Survey, um, Jeremy Lancaster, Dave Longstreth, and Don Lindsay. Dave Longstreth has been out and about, you may have seen him, he's um, out in the Santa Cruz Mountains working. And he's working with several of our PhD students from um, our program, including some of my own, um, who are kind of trying to uh, help refine our understanding of the hazard. And they, they really have zeroed in on, on this part of the landscape um, kind of above and below Boulder Creek. And, and so this is a, just to orient you guys here, here's State Route, here's Highway 9, here's 236, so this is Big Basin Road here, okay. This is Junction Park in the town of Boulder Creek. Um, and so the San Lorenzo River goes up off of this screen and, and Bear Creek goes off in the other direction. Um, this big creek right here is Clear Creek, and this other big creek right here is Jameson Creek, and there's Jameson Creek Road along here. And for those of you that live in the San Lorenzo Valley, you'll know this. And, and what's colored on this map are areas where um, these scientists, geologists from the California Geological Survey have identified either recent or prehistoric deposition due to debris flows. Um, and so these are those same fans, like I showed you in Death Valley, um, accumulating on the valley bottom as these kind of steep river catchments intersect the San Lorenzo River Valley, okay? And so this is, this is really important geomorphic, geologic and geomorphological context because these are sort of landforms that record debris flow deposition on geologic timescales, which means that we know they've happened there at some point in the geologic past. And actually there's a key here where the yellow are places where these guys think there's been deposition within the last 10,000 years. Um, so these are long time scales, right? So we deal in like high magnitude, but low frequency types of events. Um, and then the, the tan color are, um, is a sort of a different category. The dark color are fan surfaces that they think are inactive, which probably means that these are relics from maybe the ice age when the climate was, was different in this part of the world. So, but we have very shaky control on how old a lot of these features are. So I think the take home is just that there is a topographic record of debris flows occurring in this landscape um, and, and in, in places where people now have built houses and, and roads. Um, you'll see there's a very sharp line across the landscape right here. That line represents the geologic contact between the granitic rocks which many of you know from kind of this landscape and the sedimentary rocks that overlie those, um, those units. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very clear feature of the landscape in the Santa Cruz Mountains once you recognize that. Um, okay, so again, take home message here and here's a link to this report. It's actually on the county website. Um, this is a really, really nice thoughtful um, report by these guys who've spent a lot of time this fall out here looking at the landscape. So I, I urge you to look at this and just kind of the take home is we know that there have been debris flows in this landscape in the past. Yeah. And Noah, um, we did have a question about the data that's being taken for this type of study. Um, are they 
Are they looking for visual cues or is it soil cores? How do you mainly know we're just doing interpretation. So like when you're driving in a car along big basin road, there are road cuts uh, through debris flow deposits. And if you're a geologist, you can recognize debris flow deposits because they have a very characteristic um, structure to them. In, in particular, they tend to be what we call inversely graded, which means that the boulders are typically at the top. Um, and they're very poorly sorted compared to sediments that are deposited by rivers. So they're actually quite straightforward to recognize if you've had experience looking at them. So mainly what they're looking at is the topography itself, looking at evidence of those fans, and then looking at road outcrops that expose what's inside of those fans. Okay, interesting. And also- but a lot of this is just experience. You know, we spend a lot of time looking and, and gain kind of an intuition for this kind of thing as well. Would you, if you valuable. did take soil samples, would that tell you something too from the contents being different at these different? It, it would, it's just that drilling holes is expensive and really hard and you end up with like one point, right? Whereas like, you know, if you're walking around, you can exploit rivers that cut channels through these deposits and you can exploit roads that cut through these right. things and you just get a much more three-dimensional picture of the ground from that kind of uh, approach. Yeah, love road cuts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and someone also just requested that um, when pointing, if you could move the cursor a little slower. No problem. Thank, Thank you <laughs> for the feedback. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so this is um, it's something I, I constantly drives me crazy about my grad students. So um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, they drive too fast on the screen for me. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and so this is really the area that a lot of us are concerned about because there's steep channels, the, these things that kind of bite into this relatively flat surface that Ben Lohman, um, or the, sorry, that, that Bonnie Dune has developed on Ben Lohman Mountain up here. Um, and, and so the California Geological Survey, the USGS has put out, we're monitoring, uh, grad students in uh, UC Santa Cruz are monitoring um, these catchments for signs of debris flows and things like that. But one of the things that we struggle with, um, and when I say we, I don't, I'm not really doing this, but I'm familiar enough with the science, is this problem that the debris flow hazard models that are employed by the USGS, that indeed are what's underneath the hood, of those maps that I showed you, as well as the California Geological Survey, these are calibrated from events in Southern California. Remember, these aren't physics-based models. What they're doing is going to places where there were burns and they're going to individual watersheds and they're saying, okay, was there debris flow here? What can we quantify about how intense the burn was, et cetera? And they construct a model. And so here is just a, a map showing you the blue data points are kind of the points that have been used to calibrate the model that is being currently employed to predict the hazard in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And, and what's obvious from this is that it's entirely from Southern California, because that's really the area where mostly we have this association between intense fires and, and catastrophic erosion. So a very reasonable question that you might ask, and that certainly the both California Geological Survey, CAL FIRE, and the US Geological Survey, um, all the people, all the agencies, state and federal, that are involved in trying to mitigate these hazards, they are asking the same question, which is how applicable are these models um, to the landscape that we live on? It's important because the topography, soils, vegetation, and climate in Southern California are different in, and in different and potentially important ways. Um, and so one, way that we can kind of try to get at this is by looking at the last time we had a big fire in this landscape, which is the Lockheed fire, which some of you may remember from occurred in um, August of 2009. Um, this is right around when I started at Santa Cruz. Here's a, a, a burn severity map of um, the Lockheed fire and it just burned within the Scott Creek watershed um, in particular. Here's an image of Mill Creek showing you the really intense burning, which primarily occurred on the ridge tops. And that has a lot to do with the vegetation differences between the ridge tops compared to the valley bottoms in this landscape. <clears throat> what was really remarkable and unique about this storm, with, about this, with this fire was that in October of 2009, and again, many of you may remember this, there was an immense storm. There was a another remnant of a tropical storm, which is exactly the same 
meteorological condition that triggered the lightning events that caused all these fires this last summer. This storm was not associated with lightning, but it was associated with a huge amount of rainfall. And indeed, um, in the middle of October in 20, 2009, this storm rained about a foot in the Santa Cruz Mountains and in parts of the Big Sur Coast, <laughs> Mining Ridge, which is typically the rain gauge that gets the most rain um, along the Central Coast, got like 21 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. It was a remarkable storm. Um, and so we had this natural experiment where we had a, a burn and in places a pretty intense burn followed by a really large rain event. Um, and if we look at the, this is a graph of, <laughs> excuse me, the rainfall as measured at the Ben Lomond rain gauge in the Santa Cruz mountains for the period of October 13th to October 15th, 2009. And what you're seeing are bar graph recording the amount of rain every hour over this time interval. And um, shown in the y-axis here is the depth of rain. And note that there was one hour where the rain rate just tipped up over one inch per hour, okay? Notably, um, one of my grad students who's now graduated and but still living in Santa Cruz and her husband, Drew Perkins, who's definitely a friend of the Santa Cruz Natural History Museum um, and now works for Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz and is kind of the, the guru for building trails in Santa Cruz for mountain biking. Many of you may know him. He was getting a master's degree at Cal Poly um, and was living on the Swanton Ranch and Carrie, who was getting a PhD at, at UC Santa Cruz was also living up there. And, and so they, along with a number of the other students and staff at, at the um, Cal Poly Swanton Pacific Ranch had an opportunity to really make some good observations following and during this storm event. And, and what Drew and Carrie noticed was that there were small debris flows that were triggered in the Little Creek watershed, which is right here, which parts of which burned pretty severely. At that exact time when the rain just ticked up over that kind of one inch per hour threshold. And so that observation, and here's a map from data that they collected, just these white dots show locations where they noted small debris flows that intersected the road here. And the green squares are places where they noted really catastrophic soil erosion at the surface, which can kind of be the beginning stages of that bulking process. It's called rilling. Um, and and that, the fact that we started to see the landscape unraveling right around that one inch per hour threshold, it's just one event, it's just one set of observations, but it's suggestive of that maybe you were starting to push the landscape across the tipping point where some more catastrophic things could have happened, but fortunately didn't at that time. Um, here's just some pictures that Drew took of, this is up uh, on Swanton Pacific Ranch land in Little Creek Watershed, showing you sort of this, these are rills, these sort of fine, uh, fine erosional channels developed on hill slopes that are really characteristic of post-fire erosion driven by runoff over the ground surface. And here's um, someone just standing in one of those rills to give you a sense for how actually large these features are. So again, the sense from the Lockheed fire was that um, once we pushed the landscape across that kind of inch per hour threshold, um, we started to see things that were suggestive of, of um, the beginnings of debris flow initiation. Although fortunately we didn't see anything more than that. Yeah. I just have a question about the rills. Is that something that you see only when you get these large rain events or like, do you see it in post-fire landscapes with um, smaller uh, rain events, or is there a certain level where you start to see that? No, I'm, I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's like, it's like associated with this bulking process. So it's kind of like the, it's the, what you see kind of highest up on the landscape before the landscape is kind of organized into a network of channels. So it's kind of like the beginning of the channelization process that happens on the landscape. So it is typically, you see it in other settings, but that's, you usually see it when, like if you're in a gravel pit where there's no vegetation or some other setting where there's no vegetation, um, you, you need to really disrupt the landscape to kind of get this kind of thing happening. Okay, um, so just to kind of, uh, I'm almost done here. Um, I think the observations in the, uh, the Lockheed fire kind of tell us that that one inch per hour rainfall intensity is, is probably a good rule of thumb for when debris flow initiation becomes likely in, in our landscape. And indeed that's exactly the, 
the magnet, that's exactly the intensity of the storm that the USGS is using to, to sort of for their debris flow hazard model. So um, what you'll see if you go to the National Weather Service, um, who are very, the San Francisco Forecast Office is, is really where you want to go for relevant information on upcoming rainstorms, because they're including predictions of rainfall intensity and potential impacts on recent burns. So they're very focused on this FOS fire hazard. And in many of their forecast products are explicitly talking about these rainfall intensities and the likelihood that we may see problems of, with erosion. Um, so to the extent that you are concerned as a resident in the San Lorenzo Valley, let's say, you know, the weather service is a really good um, resource because they're predicting days in advance of these storm events, what the likely intensities are going to be associated with them. Um, I just wanna finish by just a couple of important things to just emphasize here, which is that debris flows can travel downstream into regions that did not burn, right? So just because you see debris flow initiation, you see a map like this where you have you know, debris flow hazards, um, some of these channels initiate in burned parts of the landscape but travel down into unburned landscapes. And the debris, debris flows don't really care um, once they've started whether they're in a burned or an unburned landscape. And so this was unfortunately one of the really tragic aspects of the Montecito debris flows following the Thomas fire. So this map should look familiar, except that now we're in Montecito, now near Santa Barbara rather than Santa Cruz, but this is the same USGS post-fire debris flow hazard assessment. But in this case, um, one of the things that wasn't communicated as well as it could have been um, following this fire was that all these places where we saw a very high probability of a debris flow occurring um, were upstream of regions that didn't burn. And when you look at a map like this, you might say, if I live here, then everything's okay. Um, but in point of fact, the damage, if you look at a zoom in of this square right here, this is just a map of houses that were damaged um, during those debris flows. And the, the red dots are houses that were severely damaged. And you see most of the damage was downstream of the burn itself, right? And so this is just an important point to recognize is that debris flows can and do travel downstream of regions that did into regions that didn't burn. And this is something that's not communicated on the USGS post-fire debris flow hazard assessments. All they're trying to do is say, where are debris flows likely to occur? They're not trying to model where they'll go. Um, and then another important point that was clear in Montecito is that debris flows can jump out of stream channels much more easily than a, a river can. And, and this happens when the, the channel can clog with sediment and divert the flow out of the channel or often where you have culverts underneath roads, those can plug really easily. And so one of the other hazards associated with these types of events is that they can easily get out of the channels and start spilling over the landscape. Um, okay, so, so I think the important take homes are, debris flows are possible within the Santa Cruz mountains this winter, um, but the USGS landslide hazards program has numerous really good resources that are geared at helping the public to understand the post-fire hazard. Here's the web that you can kind of link to the kind of key information there. Um, debris flows can flow downstream of recently burned regions along stream channels and into regions that did not burn, as I just said. Debris flows can also flow out of existing channels, as I just said. Um, and so, you know, understanding the debris flow hazard that's upstream of where you live is really important. Um, Debris flows typically don't travel into the main river network. So like Boulder Creek, Bear Creek, San Lorenzo River, you won't see debris flows flowing into those big river channels. They're just not steep enough. Um, but everything that feeds into them, um, it's, more it's more possible. So California Geological Survey has made interpretations of where debris flow deposition is likely. That's one of the maps that I showed you. So these maps are a good community resource um, to start just thinking about. Um, and then finally, the National Weather Service uh, San Francisco office is very focused on post-fire debris flow hazards and their forecasters and forecast products can help anticipate, you know, upcoming storms. I routinely read what's called the Bay Area forecast, for, uh, forecast model discussion, which is just every six hours, the National Weather Service updates its models. And there's a couple of nerdy guys who write blog posts about the model 
forecast model, there's three different models that are being run at the same time. And that's a good place to kind of get a start to thinking where you can get to start to see how people are thinking about forecasting rainfall intensity. But importantly, we can forecast weather up to about a week in advance now. And so we have a good lead time on a lot of these storms. Okay, um, that's all I have prepared for you. I guess that did take an hour. I didn't think it would. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to entertain questions over, um, over the chat. Awesome. We do uh, have a few questions. One's kind of a comment, but maybe you can um, address it. So Steve writes, my understanding is that hydrophobic soils are spotty in occurrence and that factors like loss of root reinforcement and loss of surface vegetation are just as important, if not more so, in debris flow initiation. Yes and no. So yes, absolutely, that's spotty. No question. And, and in a landscape with big trees, it's very different than one of these chaparral dominated landscapes like in Southern California. As far as the root reinforcement, that is true, but it takes a couple of years for the loss of the roots to really manifest, right? Because, uh, you know, the roots don't, you know, the burn doesn't penetrate the soil more than about 10 centimeters at the most. So those roots are intact and they take a while to decay. So while it's true that you see an effect due to the root reinforcement loss, that's typically delayed. And in fact, USGS has done beautiful studies of this in Southern California that show a pulse of landsliding that occurs, but it typically occurs two to three years after the fire. That's due exactly to the, what you're talking about. Um, also, we've got some interest in mitigation um, and wondering if you have any uh, recommendations for preparing for debris flow to mitigate damage. Um, if there's anything that could be done. I mean, I think, I think the key is <laughs> I, there's not, if you're in the path of a big debris flow, it's hard to mitigate. Um, so I think the first thing is just to understand where your house is in relation to some of these steep catchments um, and, and what the sort of probability of debris flows is. And, and beyond that, it's so site specific that I, I really yeah. feel like I would be irresponsible if I said anything about it. Yeah. Um, and then another question kind of on the same vein, but more, um, <clears throat> you know, in advance of the next maybe fire event, uh, if you have any recommendations for management practices that can be done to reduce, um, you know, major runoff events. In this I mean, I think we know, I mean, as Marissa alluded to uh, at the beginning, <laughs> The, one of the frustrating aspects of this problem is that, you know, we, we developed our landscape before we to understood how best to manage it. And so now we're kind of in a pickle because it's hard to do manage. I mean, we have two problems. One is that people live everywhere in the landscape, so it's hard to do manage burns. And also, unfortunately, the air pollution laws make it very hard for us in California to do burning because the, the combination of fuel moisture conditions and atmospheric conditions that enable us to do controlled burns mean that there's just not that many opportunities throughout the year when we can do it. Yeah. Um, and you did mention that a lot of the area that we're talking about that has been impacted by the CZU lightning complex is, you know, it's redwood forest. It's these big wooded um, areas. And I'm just wondering if you can touch on that a little bit more on like the, the, the unique qualities of this landscape um, yeah. and and also, I mean, I'm wondering with the bulking that you were, that, that we've been talking about today, as opposed to mudslide types of erosion, if erosion were to the level of like taking down a tree, would that be part of bulking, part of mudslide? Does it depend? And yeah. are the types of erosion that you're talking about, is it possible that something with a shallow root structure could could come down with, with that? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, I, I think, the short answer is, you know, one of the reasons that's we don't have a lot of observations from high intensity burns in redwood forests because it doesn't happen very much, right? And and so I think we don't have a good idea about how the landscape will behave erosionally or hydrologically, flat out. Um, as far as taking down redwood trees, I think I, I have seen. I was a grad student in in the Pacific Northwest at University of Washington, and I saw amazing debris flows up in the Olympic Peninsula that easily transported old growth Sitka spruce trees with no problem. And so these flows have, are capable of taking out old growth trees without any difficulty and transporting them. Um, the question is, 
is our landscape going to operate like Southern California? And, and we don't really know, but I think there's reasons to think probably not. It's not as steep as the San Gabriel Mountains, San Bernardino Mountains are. So that's a really important difference. And it doesn't have this sort of unbroken chaparral like, like exists down there. So we, the trees, I, I have to believe, will make the hydrological functioning of the landscape just pretty different than these homogeneous slopes that are covered in chaparral. Um, but again, we don't have, a, that's my intuition. We don't have a lot of data to support that. Yeah. yeah. yeah but that's the hope of, of people this winter. And one of the reasons that Cal, Cal Fire and California Geological Survey are actively doing work in the Santa Cruz Mountains because they really want to be able to better understand how to forecast the hazard in these types of events. Yeah, there's a lot to be learned during this winter. And it sounds like, you know, unfortunately, I know a lot of people want answers now, but it seems like the research that people on your team and the USGS are going to be doing this winter are going to be helping to answer a lot of questions for for future yeah. events yeah. is kind of where we're at. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing all the resources that you did for for the rest of us to um, further educate ourselves and do our own kind of modeling is kind of what it sounds like too is what you're recommending. Um, and I know people are very interested in like their particular addresses and their particular towns and where they live and um, and I really think that what you helped us with tonight is um, being able to kind of look in the right places to, to get a better sense of um, the conditions for where we are. Um, and I do wanna reiterate that um, Noah's gonna be sharing all those links with me. So I will be sending out an email um, following this with, with all of them included so you can further dig around um, and also just share that another wonderful resource in town are our partners at the Resource Conservation District, the RCD. Um, they've got recordings of a lot of programs um, that are very helpful for, um, for people whose properties have been impacted. So I also recommend visiting the RCD um, if you'd like to learn more. And um, we just got a question that came in. And also I'll say that, yes, there will be a recording. We'll make it available. Um, we live on Highway 9 at the mouth of a debris fan where the hillside behind us burned down to nothing but old growth and ash. We have watershed and um, live below Mulaski Creek. What can we expect? So that's kind of like a very specific area, but it sounds like they already have a debris fan. Yeah, um, so if you live on a, I mean, I would I would go to the, the mapping that the California Geological Survey did um, that I linked on the site and that I showed in, in my talk um, and, and go to the USGS debris flow hazard map. But I mean, if, if it were me, you know, again, I don't know the details of where you live, but, you know, a good thing to do is to look at the weather forecast and maybe, you know, if it's, if a big intense winter storm is forecast, it might not be a bad idea to just go somewhere else for a minute. Yeah. And stay safe. Yeah. yeah um, stay I guess safe. I'll just, one really last little question that I have for you is that I know that we got a mild amount of rain a couple, a few weeks ago. Um, so not a lot, but a little. Does that have any, you know, bearing on what we might expect? The fact that we like kind of moistened things a little, but not a, not a lot. I, I think it's possible. I, I've, I've, I'm actually working much more in the SCU burn complex. So the field areas that I work on are in the Diablo range, so east of San Jose. And so I've been looking at how that landscape has been recovering. And what I've seen is that little bit of rainfall that we got you know, has been enough to start the grass sprouting. And I think to the extent that you're starting to poke vegetation through the soil, you're reconnecting the sort of plumbing system and allowing the water to get back into the soil. So I think time just with animals, you know, there's animals that are just constantly churning the soil here, right? So time and that bit of rain I think probably works in, in our favor in terms of hazard, just because the longer we wait, especially if we've had a bit of rain already, which we did, you know, the more likely that that sort of hydrophobic layer um, is going to start to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And one last question. This will be the last one. Sure, it's fine. Um, so but assuming that this is a mild winter and say we don't have a lot of catastrophic debris flow issues, um, are there studies from other areas that indicate what might happen in years following that? So the following winter, if that's like a really wet year for instance. Yeah, and I linked, I mentioned this in the talk um, from Southern California, 
where again, we have a lot of information, a lot of data, the sense is that at one to two years, there's an elevated window and that's about it. So I think if we get through this winter, much of the hazard will be reduced. Um, and, but there is this other issue of root stability that, that Steve, I believe was the person raised in this, which is a great question. And, and there are some new studies that have shown that there is sort of this secondary hazard that um, is not as related to debris flows. So it's more just isolated landslides on hill slopes. But I would say one to two years. Okay, yeah, lots to pay attention to. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing, you know, what you and your team find out and um, continuing to monitor the situation. And again, we'll be sharing links um, in a follow-up email um, so that everyone joining us tonight can continue to follow themselves. And I'm going to put in the chat, um, I'll also send an email, but here is a link to a survey. We'd love your feedback and would love to hear more about what you um, would like to see from the museum. And also another um, link if you're not already receiving our newsletter um, that we send out in the in email. Um, this is a great way to stay in touch and to um, uh, keep updated on what we've got planned. So we hope that you'll join us for, for more events. Um, and we will definitely be looking at the impacts of the CZU Lightning Complex further um, as the months move on. And I will say that we are um, also working with a lot of partners to launch a community science project so that all of you out there can help to be a part of collecting data on how this event is um, impacting our, our, our area. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Noah, thank you so very much for that and um, appreciate you sending along the resources for us to continue our learning too. Yes, thank you. Thank you all, have a good night.